Welcome to the International Lecture in honor of Hermann Stein. This is a lecture which we hold, and I'll talk more about Hermann in just a minute, but uh, basically focusing on the international program of MSAS and uh, the particular parts of that program that are very active at this point in history and we'll hear a lot from uh, the faculty experts that are very much involved in this program. It's really appropriate that we focus on international social work today because uh, we live in a time where we face great challenges internationally. Probably the greatest challenges in my seven decades of adult life. I started my adult life a long time ago just after the start of the uh, uh, United Nations and other international organizations that were developed after World War II. And these international organizations are still very important uh, uh, today, but we do face real challenges across the world, an increase in dictatorships and uh, uh, would-be dictatorships in countries in all parts of the world. Uh, so we have uh, great challenges uh, facing us uh, uh, in this day and age, and I believe we need more Hermann Steins in the world to help us face those challenges. And I do want to start out by saying just a little bit about Hermann Stein, who we honor with this lecture here today. He was dean of MSAS in the 1960s, and then became provost of the university. And when I joined the university in the 1970s, he was a university professor still at uh, CWRU. So very much uh, involved with this university, but also very much involved with social work education. And uh, he, was, uh, he started out as a social worker. He was a caseworker in New York City prior to becoming a faculty member at Columbia University School of Social Work in 1945. When I entered the program at Columbia as a student in 1960, I was very pleased to have him as one of my professors. Fourteen years later, I came to be interviewed for the deanship here at MSAS. Herman was then a university professor, and of course, one of those who interviewed me at that point of time. After I arrived in July of 1974, he was helpful, particularly as I built on his foundation in the international dimension of this school. And this school then and continues now to be very noted uh, nationally and internationally for its international program. Let me say just a few words about Hermann Stein as an internationalist. First, after World War II, he joined the Joint Distribution Committee in Europe and North America and worked with displaced victims of the Holocaust during World War II. Later, he became involved with the Division of Social Affairs of the newly established United Nations. And these roles established his international reputation and led to 21 years of service for UNICEF. He, this included both a part-time assignment during most of this time, but also taking leave without pay from his role as a university professor here at CWRU uh, to leave his mark on a number of UNICEF programs. He advocated an internet, inter, inter an integrated approach to child development and led seminars and spoke at world conferences during that period of time in the subject of child welfare. In addition to his work at the United Nations, he was also a leader in the social work profession. He served on many national boards, commissions, and committees, including president of the Council on Social Work Education and uh, also uh, involved and instrumental in establishing an independent secretariat for the International Association of Schools of Social Work in a building right across uh, the, from the United Nations in New York City. Uh, and that was actually where I began my international uh, work in that office, which Herman had really established. 
So he was a notable figure in international social work development, and he is one of the people who is, his biography is in this book, which was just published in 2017 by a British publisher, which recognizes 14 figures who have had a major impact on the international dimension of social work education. Three of those 14 figures are from the United States, the rest are from around the world. So certainly, uh, if any of you are interested in looking more about Herman, uh, the library has this book, Internationalizing Social Work Education, Insights from Leading Figures Around the Globe. Well, with that introduction, I think you've got some idea about Herman Stein and how important he was internationally, certainly also to this university. And I'm extremely pleased today that his daughter, Naomi Stein, can be with us. Naomi, please stand up and take a bow. <clears throat> okay, so now we are ready to get uh, started on the uh, Herman Stein Roundtable, which is how we will uh, proceed uh, this uh, uh, today. We're going to be uh, doing this with three experts from our faculty here at uh, Case Western Reserve University's uh, Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. And we're going to do this in two parts. Uh, the first part, each one of our experts will be talking about our international program, certainly both from the standpoint of uh, the education our students get here and their travel abroad, also international students coming here. So we'll have that part of the program and then we'll pause from the presentations to give any of you a chance the audience to ask questions at that point of time. So we will kind of break up the presentations in terms of a, a little discussion. So as the first presentations go on, please uh, feel free to uh, write down some questions you want to ask during that period of time. Then uh, for the final part of the program, we will become even broader and we will be talking about uh, the future of international social work, uh, some things about uh, social policy, any other things that our experts want to talk about at that particular point of time. So that's our plan, presentations, discussions, and then uh, uh, further uh, uh, presentations. You all have in this little uh, folder substantial bio information about our present presenters. And that's very helpful because uh, if I had to stand up here and go through the bio of each one of the three, that would be as far as we get in this program because it's obviously uh, quite substantial. So please refer to your program uh, and uh, uh, and you will get the full bio. I will just say a couple of things about each one. Uh, our, our first uh, presenter uh, for the first part of the program is uh, Dr. Kathleen Farkas, who has uh, expertise particularly in the area of substance abuse, but other areas as well, has been very active in internationally, international, both from Europe in terms of particularly focusing on Poland and Asia, spending a lot of time in China. So she brings kind of the world together in her two major international interests. Kathy, it's all yours. Okay, oh, Terry, thank you. So maybe you're wondering how did a nice Irish girl like me end up in Poland? Um, <laughs> it's a long story. I, the first time that I, I think I really started to think about international social work was through working with students who were here from the Cleveland International Program. Maybe some of you remember CIP. We had students who came to MSAS and I remember one young woman named Karen who took my course called Social Networks and Social Supports back in the 90s and uh, bringing an entirely different perspective 
to the idea of support of society, participation in society, social work in society, and really enrich that class to such an extent that I began to think much more deeply about um, what do we need to do in order to understand uh, what society should look like. So uh, Terry mentioned I had the great good fortune of uh, going to China with, with Terry and with our dean as part of the Council on Social Work Education's curriculum development effort. China, uh, China's government decided we need social work. And so we need schools of social work. And the question is, what should those look like? So that was another real lesson in cultural humility because the purpose wasn't to reinvent United States social work education in China, but to listen and to try and understand the needs from that society's point of view and to offer what were strengths, what were limitations. And we had the great good fortune to host for a year a scholar from Northwest University in Xi'an, China, who came to study with us, to meet our students, to learn and to develop curriculum. Our, she took a lot from our curriculum, but she translated it into her lens. And, and that was a wonderful experience for me to get to know her, to have a year-long colleagueship with her. But my real immersion experience came when I uh, worked with uh, Richard Romaniuk, who co-leads the course with me. It's called Invisible Groups in a New Poland. And at first, it, we're really focused on post-transformation. Since Poland became a democratic country in 1989, we're looking at the great changes in social, political, economic reforms in that country. And at first, knowing nothing about Poland, I thought, well, I can learn that. That's not that, that much of a history. And then I realized, well, no. You've got 2,000 years of Polish history and the context and to understand those changes within that context. So it, it has been one um, layer after another as we explore with students. You know, what's the impact of making that change from communist society into a capitalist economy, but within the context of the Catholic Church, of the idea of family in, in Poland, um, and just those many, many years of even during partition, Poland's wiped off the map for 123 years. So what does that mean in terms of understanding the history? So I, I think every time I go to Poland, I'm reminded of how much I don't know and how much there is to learn. And then through the eyes of the students who ask such wonderful questions and are able to see what's the same, what's different, and to ask those, like, why is this different? Um, and, and, and the assumptions. I, I think when you travel, you realize the assumptions that you live with day to day. So I'll tell you a quick story. Um, the first time I went to Poland, I, of course, everything was new. And uh, we are based at the university there. We have a partnership with Adam Miskiewicz University in Poznań, and we are based there. So I walk into the university the first day, and there's a coat room and you can check your coat, and there's a lady at the coat room who takes, takes your coat, hangs it up. Well, I'm thinking this is the height of civilization. This is just the greatest. Until Richard pulls me aside and he says, do you know why we have these ladies? It's from communist times when everybody had to have a job, and this is make work. And so we don't respect these ladies. They're left over from communist time. So. Again, that was a reminder to me. My assumption was height of civilization. You have a hat check lady. But no, it was not that. And to have to you know, ask, whose story do you want to know? What part of the history? What is the perspective that you take? So it is just an unfold. We've had the great good fortune again to go to Poland every year since 2010. Um, and developed relationships with scholars, with students, um, and have a number of people that we also bring here um, to say we have a, a, a Fulbright scholar 
uh, from Adam Miskevich, who will be here in March to study with us for a year. So it's been an exciting partnership, and I think happens because the school has an investment in international, international studies, international social work, and allows it to have, it's made space for it, it's given it a priority. I could talk the whole time. I think maybe I better just stop now and <laughs> ask Victor. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Good start. So we're going to go on to the other two experts. Uh, Dr. Victor Grossa is a uh, international expert in the field of child welfare. And uh, he has done a lot of work in a lot of different uh, uh, countries. You can kind of see what uh, they are by looking on, uh, on, on a sheet. Romania, India, Ukraine, Guatemala, and Ethiopia. So he certainly has been around the world, but focusing particularly on child welfare and parent-child relationships. Victor. I am an accidental internationalist. When I was starting my career in child welfare and child mental health, I had no plans to be out of the country. But then one day, I saw this program on TV about children and in institutions in Romania, and my heart was moved. And I, I called one organization and said, well, I just saw this, I have off every summer, if I can help, let me know. And by the way, my grandparents immigrated from Romania. Now, I didn't speak Romanian, except the bad words. That's the only thing my grandmother taught me. But because I had developed expertise in child welfare, the next day I got a call from an organization that had a U.S. aid grant, and I started in 1991 going to Romania. And by 1992, I was taking students with me uh, because people were interested in what was happening globally with children. And one of the things I think I've learned from all these different experiences is, number one, if you leave a door open, you can enter another door at the same time. So the work in Romania just opened up opportunities for me to work in Ukraine and Kazakhstan and India. And as diverse as those countries are, there's also some very basic things that are the same in all of us, regardless of where we come from. But part of this experience for me and for the students is you can have technical knowledge, but it doesn't always translate into what that country actually needs or wants. So you have to start from the premise of regardless of what knowledge or skills you have is what does that country want right now? It doesn't matter what you think they need. It doesn't matter what other people think they need. And let me tell you, organizations in all these countries from UNICEF to the World Bank always have an opinion about what a country needs to do. It never works if you're imposing your will on a country. What works the best and what students learn, I think, from these experiences is you have to know the people. You have to know what the people value. You have to know kind of the cultural norms. And so it is an exercise in cultural humility to always be open to learning from the people who you're there to also help. And I think there's implications for that as you work in the United States. I would say that one of the things that for and most of my work is in child welfare, it, and I've been fortunate to take people who've been in public child welfare in the United States, is it makes them clearer about their own values and their own beliefs. They come back better child advocates because they get to see children in conditions unlike what we have in the United States as a high resource country. They also learn so much about themselves. You know, first when they're involved with international social work, it's very exotic. They're very excited. You know, it's, it's really interesting to go someplace else. But what happens pretty quickly is this acculturation process where they don't like the uncomfortable feelings they have. They don't understand the norms. They may not have hot water. They may not be able to use a regular toilet like we're used to here, and so they start whining, right? And they get very uncomfortable, which is really the opportunity for growth because it's only when you step out of your comfort zone that you begin to really learn about yourself and learn about p other people around you. And if they stick with it, and all of them have so far, what they begin to do is really understand the worldview from somebody else's standpoint. 
it changes their lives forever because when they come back to the United States, it opens up their mind so that they look at the same situation but from multiple perspectives. I think the other thing that, that they learn is you can't trust always the media. Uh, so much of what we, we accept as fact is what we hear on the news or read in the paper, but they are biased reports. And so one of the things I, I really think helps people to become internationalized is read other reports than just the U.S. news and start or even have a news gap. So some of the countries I work in, like I was in India for 9-11, I was in a rural area and I was with this agency and they were moving babies from a shelter to a longer term care. And so for six hours, I was in this remote area with no radio. And so all this was happening in the United States. I get back to my host and she says, well, I got something to tell you and it's bad news. And of course, my reaction is, uh oh, something's happening in my family. She says, well, the US has been bombed, the World Trade Centers are destroyed and here's the TV, watch what's going on. And that was it. But there was something about not being part of that makes you look at that differently, right? Because there's like this collective response if you're here participating, but there's a different response when you're in another context. And so I, I think these international contexts really change the way that people think about themselves, they think about social work, and they think about child welfare. Thank you very much, Victor. I think the emphasis on cultural norms is something we want to come back to in the discussion session. That's tremendous. Uh, our third presenter, uh, Dr. David Miller, is a man who wears many hats. The recent, most recent hat he put on is as chair of the Case Western Reserve University Faculty Senate the uh, uh, university-wide position, which does take a little bit of time, I think, David, as well. But he continues to be very active in his other roles, including his international role. And again, he has been to uh, many different countries, uh, uh, South Korea, Cambodia, uh, Amsterdam and the Netherlands. I'll let, you tell, I'll let him tell you about his other roles, OK? <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay on this? All right. I would like to thank everyone for coming out today and to celebrate the legacy of Herman Stein and what he meant to not only the Mandel School, but Case Western Reserve, as well as the profession of social work and the things that he stood for, particularly understanding the international perspective. As I was listening to Kathy and Victor talk about their experiences, and as well as knowing about Terry's, and say, okay, what what do I add to this, or what can I add to that? So I'll just kind of, my perspective, first and foremost, is I believe that all of us, particularly as social workers, should have an international experience to understand, as Victor said, and as Kathy said, to be uncomfortable in an area where you may not know the language, you may not know the traditions, but to see and understand how people live and how they deal with problems and issues in their own country. Because sometimes here in the U.S., and more often than not, a lot of times, we seem to think that we have the best solution, and clearly we don't. And how we perceive problems and how other countries perceive those very same problems, whether it's poverty, substance abuse, child abuse, child maltreatment, how we deal with the elderly or any host of issues, other countries have a perspective on it that we can learn from. And I believe when we get outside of the Atlantic and the Pacific, we can see through the lens of others how problems can be solved or at least addressed in a forthright manner. As a kid growing up in the segregated South, when you could only have three or four channels on television, I thought I was going to get a first class ticket to Southeast Asia and with Walter Cronkite and go to Vietnam. So very early I had an inkling and understanding to go to that part of the world. I wanted to go, and then my friend said, why do you want to go to Cambodia? I said, I've been hearing about it for at least 30 years of my life and having the opportunity to go there and Korea. 
when I was in South Korea teaching at Iwa Women's University, little did I know that several months after I left there, the students, now these are the students, the corruption of the president sounds familiar. The corruption of the president in that country was so great that the students at Iwa University protested protested, protested until their voices were heard and the President Park was pushed out of office and convicted and she is now in prison and that was students. International example of what the power and voice of students coming together to lead a revolution. As a master's student at the University of South Carolina, it was during the time that countries, or not countries, well, countries, but also many institutions led by students were attempting to have their universities, their state governments, and businesses to divest from South Africa during the height of apartheid. As a student, I believed that we, I as a student, could not sit comfortably in my classroom knowing that there was a regime in this world that made people that looked like me second class citizens to carry pass books. So I decided one day on my own to put a shanty town in the middle of the University of South Carolina. Didn't go over well with the people there, but it was the School of Social Work and the dean and the associate dean and my classmates that gave me the support to challenge the school's money and investments in South Africa. And now to have an opportunity to take students there so that they can see what is going on in post-apartheid South Africa, which still has the largest in <clears throat> income inequality in the world. Poverty rates are sky high. On one side of the street are million dollar homes, and across the street are corrugated steel, a third of a box car in which people or two or three homes, two or three families may live in. So for me, international education and opportunities is to expose our students, our alums, as well as myself and my faculty colleagues to the challenges that others have to face, but also the joy and the wonderment of their lives, what they bring to the table. Spending time with my daughter in Morocco a couple of years ago when she was in the Peace Corps, I was taken by the generosity of people who had so little and who were willing to share with us what little they had to make us feel comfortable. And I think sometimes we miss that when we're here, here in our bustling world. So when we're outside of the confines of the U.S. and we're in, an, in a place where we don't know the language, we can't even ask, where's the bathroom? We understand that we have to be vulnerable. We understand that our creature comforts, such as getting clean water, having a place that's safe, to stay and sleep at night depends on someone else. And so through that, I hope that my students, as well as myself, continue to learn the importance of our connectedness with others around the world. And for me, I believe that's the most important thing that we learn. We're all connected on this planet in some way, in some shape, in some fashion, regardless of where our zip code or our residence is, there's somebody in this world that we can make a connection with to help along this path. And I believe international education takes that to the next level. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, both for information and the passionate uh, approach to it. Okay, so we have had three presentations focused particularly on the student experience. Uh, well, I want to see if there are questions from anybody in the uh, audience about particularly the student experience, either the student experience 
MSAS students who are going elsewhere or international students coming to MSAS. Uh, are there any uh, questions or comments anybody wants to make at this point in time? No. Right. Sure. Let's, please go. Everybody heard Regina? Okay. Can we yeah, have, go ahead. Can we have Regina? Thank you, Regina, for your question. Uh, sorry. Can Kathy, sure he, he, oh, okay. he wants me to repeat the question again. Uh, my question is that I know Victor has a language immersion component uh, to the Guatemala Travel Abroad Program. Uh, and I wonder if Kathy and your uh, travel bar programs, and David, do you also have a language immersion component? And Victor, would you speak to the value of doing just that? So, so I'll start and then we'll hand it over. So in the first time I went to Poland, I, I went to school to try and learn some, someone unsuccessfully uh, Polish language because I thought it was important to be able to at least say hello, to be able to ask where the bathroom was, uh, and, and to, uh, Polish is a pretty difficult language, it's a Slavic language and there's not too many cognates. We teach students um, some of the basics so they can do those kind of basic things but there's no real language immersion. Since Poland joined EU in 2004, there has been a real push to include English education. So if you talk to people in Poland who are my age, they speak Russian and Polish. But if you talk to people who are 30 and younger, they almost always speak English and are eager to speak English. So that has helped us to do that. But your point is a really good one. It, it, if you're going to have relationship with people, you have to show some basic knowledge of the culture and some interest in the culture. And, and learning a couple of Polish words can take you a long way. And the same in South Africa, as you, as you know, it was under the apartheid rule, which was part of uh, the Dutch and the Germans. So many of the South Africans speak multiple languages, one of which is English. When we were there the last time, several of the individuals working with the Duco Africa spoke Zulu, uh, Kosa and several other languages, so that opportunity for the students to learn some some words again, hello and goodbye, just some of the very basic words, thank you. We had that opportunity. Going forward, we are asking for for future opportunities to have some language immersion. But again, there's so many different competing languages for there. But we believe it's very important and. You know, international travel and international education, as you know, we find out that the U.S. is the one country that is monolinguistic. You know, everybody else speaks three and four languages. You see, what's wrong here with that? <laughs> so I think really uh, learning language in Guatemala or Mexico, even if you're a native Spanish speaker, you're learning Guatemala Spanish and you're learning Mexican Spanish, which is different. There's not one universal Spanish language, but it's also a cultural experience because in the programs you work in, they're often social enterprises. So that means not only do they pay their staff, but they also then invest the fees that we pay back into the community. So Guatemala, they have a mobile library that goes to the villages where kids don't have access to books. And we bring books in Spanish and they go to these communities and the kids get to sit in the bus and read the books. And I think for the students, the, the Teachers not only teach you book learning, but they'll also take it to the market so you know what to call things, and they'll tell you about their lives. And I think that's really where the language instruction is more important, is they're hearing from a real person who has some facility with English as well as, as teaching Spanish, but they're really learning about their lives and, and what it means to be a Guatemalan or a Mexican or a Nicaraguan. So I, I think if you can integrate those into programs, I think it really benefits students, particularly we don't expect people to speak Spanish. What we do expect people, though, is to learn culturally. And I think that's what the experience does for them. Great. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, if everybody who has a question, please introduce yourself as well as ask your question. Hi. Hi, I'm Donna Stapleton. I'm a SAS graduate. Um, and SAS, I just have to back up a little bit and say, SAS's ecological approach really meant a lot to me in my career. Um, and I'm married to a historian who has taken me around the world. And so we've had a lot of international experiences. Um, with, and all of what you've said just touches the, the essence of what we've learned. Um, I'm wondering whether the students come back and understand about the diversity in this country and, and start listening in a different way and watching in a different way, not only on the international, but on the, on, in their own communities. Um, when we were lucky enough to host international people, it made me start thinking about our culture. We cut our food. Other countries cut, pre-cut their food. And, you know, the things about coats and, I, I'm just interested in, in seeing whether they can transfer it back even if they stay in this country. I don't know if this will, this will start it. It won't answer it. So in, in Poland, uh, which is a pretty homogeneous society, until you start to look at the society, Poland has one of the biggest refugee numbers in all of Europe. But, but the people who come, immigration numbers, let's make a difference between refugees, it's immigration. So, but they're Ukrainians. And Ukrainians look very much like Poles and have a very similar language, a very similar. So we spend a lot of time talking with our Polish colleagues who have clear feelings about Ukrainians. And uh, even though they look exactly the same, I mean, it's, unless you have a good ear, you can't really hear the difference between the accent. Um, so I think it's, it does, we do have conversations when we come back about what is diversity? What, how do we think about diversity? What are the ways in which we perceive and recognize diversity? Because they are changed by that. We, we have um, opportunity to talk with Polish students, with Polish faculty, but then also fellows from the Lane Kirkland Fellowship, which is emerging democracies. They come to Poland from, from Ukraine, from Belarus, from Armenia, from all these Eastern, Eastern European, Russian uh, countries to study. And they all have views on that. So uh, when we come back and we meet, all of us meet once with our students after we come back from, from travel study. And those issues always come up about, and it's about identity as well. Yeah. yeah. I, I think for most of the students, students don't recognize how much privilege they have until they're in a situation where they don't understand the language, the culture, the norms. And that's true both for our African-American as well as our Caucasian students. And we have taken about a third of our students have been African-Americans, but they've been middle class African-American students. And they, for the first time in their lives, are a minority, right? They, because that, once you become middle class, you know, some of those things start to disappear. They're not as obvious, but here they're a minority. And so they come back recognizing what it's like to have privilege and what it's like for others who don't understand always the norms around them, who don't understand the language that we use or the idioms that we use. And I think it just brings a, a sensitivity to them about all the diversity that exists with the people that they work with and the people they interact with. So I do think it's transformational in that way. I have to agree with everything my colleagues pointed out. When we are in South Africa, the students are, are trying to figure out, OK, you say you're Kosa, you say you are Zulu, you say you are from another tribe. So, OK, what, what's the difference? You know, you, you, you see the outward look. What is the difference? It's the language. But then when they understand and they hear about the culture and the history of the various nations, they, they begin to see that. And then when they return, they attempt to apply that in their 
their daily lives here. And hopefully that experience continues to translate with them and resonate. One of the things that the students who traveled in the last course to South Africa, they've maintained contact with various members of the group because it was such a connection. They have desired to learn more about South Africa and, and its history and the different nations that are there. So it, it provides them with a chance to continue to learn diversity of a different type outside of, outside of the U.S. I think it also forces them to start thinking about their own genealogy. Uh, so it's really interesting because they come back and think, well, where am I from? Where do I belong in this? human history, you know, what are my roots? Because a lot of people, they think of themselves as American, but what is American? Well, American, like my grandparents are immigrants. I mean, we're children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of immigrants, and so where do we all start? So they, they come back, I think, also interested in further exploring who am I, which I think is profound. Any other questions? Well, I have one. We've talked a great deal about, and, and well, uh, about our students having experiences abroad. What about students from abroad who have experiences at MSAS? Uh, what type of experiences do they have, and how does the program help them? I know right now, the past few years, a lot of students from China, but there have been a lot of students from Africa, uh, India in the past, uh, Europe. Uh, any comments on that for many of you? I, I can't speak for the students, but I know that having students in both the master's and the PhD courses from other countries, that they enrich the conversation. They bring in a different point of view. They ask a different set of questions. They have personal experiences that I think, um, you know, that to, to travel and to come to school in a different culture takes a lot of courage. And I think sometimes that personal story of courage is just inspirational to our domestic students and helps them recognize their, their privilege and uh, some of the things that um, they maybe hadn't encountered for. So I'm always very happy to see uh, in my class roster when I have some names that maybe I can't pronounce so well the first time um, or people who come from different cultures because it just adds so much to what we are able to talk about because it's a different point of view. I think they also push us exactly. right? yeah. about, okay, this is the American way of doing things or thinking about things. How is this relevant to my context? And so I think it helps us be better teachers to have international students because it, it means we're not just talking about an American model of how we do things. It's also talking about how do we extend this to, so that it's relevant across uh, cultures and across countries. And I, I like that because it keeps me engaged in learning. And we're all learning, we're all teaching at the same time and they're teaching us as well as us teaching them. Yeah. I find our international students very, very engaging and, and just want to always, they're always asking questions about driving. They're always asking questions about our sports. They're always asking questions about things that we so frequently just blithely move beyond. We just, oh, well, we do this. This is how we drive. We don't use blinkers. We don't do this. We, you know, the Browns aren't good. This, all of these things, our international students are amazed and they want to know and there's a thirst for knowledge among them. And in the classroom, they provide a resource to our students that we as faculty can't necessarily offer because they can tell them in those quiet hall room, I mean, hallway moments, well, this is what it's like in my country. This is how we handle situations like this. Or, you know, I'm going out to Niagara Falls or I'm going out to Mount Rushmore and the amazement to see that in their eyes that, that they are seeing something that we see, we may have seen, we read about or heard about, 
but their enthusiasm for what goes on here that's it's I won't say it's innocence in that kind of you know naive way but it's this openness and a freshness that our students learn so much from and they may not even notice it thank you yes uh, Regina please I was so struck by what our panelists have said and talked about how our international students really enrich the conversation, um, both inside and outside of the classroom. And I want to give an example because it is, I just want to underscore what you said. Um, in my theories of oppression class and social justice, I have students from China, for example, when we talk about privilege, uh, we'll draw them into the conversation. What looks like privilege in your country? And one of the ones that we don't necessarily think about here is the urban-rural divide, you see. So there's a great source of, as you were saying, knowledge and wisdom that we garner from them and enriches and enlarges our conversation. But now there's another side, too. Um, I have had conversations with some of my students, particularly uh, from China, who often do feel alienated uh, in this environment and feel a little bit uh, marginalized and, uh, and isolated. And the, the thing that I think keeps them from uh, perhaps speaking out about it is because it goes against the, the cultural norm uh, in terms of really trying to, you know, maybe be critical uh, or be, think critically or to appear like you're criticizing someone else's their behavior. So sometimes that works in a, a kind of a, uh, a reverse fashion. But uh, I think we have to do our part. Uh, you talked about the conversation, how we'll transform. Uh, on this end, we have to really, I think, make an effort uh, to be engaging to them to a greater extent and to be more inclusive. So I see that's an area where we need to perhaps uh, address and expand. International travel is always fun, but there's kind of an added dimension when you go to China and get a chance to visit with uh, alumni of MSAS or when you uh, go to other countries and see, because we do have alumni around the world and uh, we are international in that sense as well. And that is a real pleasure of being part of this particular uh, School of Social Work. Okay, now I'm going to uh, give our uh, panel another uh, five to eight minutes to kind of comment on a little couple of little broader topics. Uh, obviously anything they want to talk about, but uh, talking a little bit about the future of international social work and what trends you see, how can uh, the international dimension of social work, uh, the social work education be improved and with particular emphasis on uh, social justice, any advice there? And this time we'll start with uh, David and then move to Victor and Kathy. Thank you, Terry. One of the things that I, well, <clears throat> while in Korea, and to some degree Cambodia, and in, as well as South Africa came to mind, is the status of women, particularly older women, as they leave the workforce and what happens after that. In Korea, I noticed uh, if Korea Seoul, if you've not been to Seoul, you, you want to go. It's a beautiful place, 10 million people. That is 24 hours, 20, 24 hours, seven days a week, constant action going. You, you, you just turn down an alleyway, literally, and there's a new place to eat. There's, there's just so much going on. But the economic disparity there is present, and it's particularly present among older women. It wasn't until the late 1990s, early 2000s that South Korea developed its social welfare system or social security, let me, let me say it that way, social security system. And like many countries that become westernized, the younger kids begin to move away from the family and the older adults kind of fend for themselves. And there's slowly ebbing into Korean culture is the children are stepping away or moving away from caring for the adults, their parents. And you're finding 
in Korea, the poverty rate is the highest in the world of nearly over 50% of Korean adults who are in their 60s are impoverished. And we're talking about a country that has one of the highest per capita GDPs in the world. So oftentimes in the mornings, I would see women, older women, pulling carts filled with cardboard and other items that they would take to a recycling center to turn it in for money or won to support or add to their social security benefits that they received. And I started thinking about that in terms of what does it mean here in the United States for women who have precarious employment histories, which we know women are in and out of the job market because of childbirth or caretaking or other activities, and we know that women don't earn as much as men. And there's some interesting similarities toward regarding women in the US and women in Korea and women in South Africa and women in Cambodia. And the social welfare systems in really, in reality, are not assisting them or providing them with enough to keep them out of poverty in the sense that their lifestyle after working is in many ways less than. Now, my colleague and I, Terry, we, we talk about Social Security. We know that here in the country, it has raised the number of people out of poverty uh, who are older. But we also know that the average benefit is about $1,300 a month. And we know that when we look at the numbers, for women, it is less than that. So there's, here's an issue that I believe is only going to grow in importance, and that is the status of women economically who are at retirement or in retirement age. What does it mean for a society? What do we provide for them? Their health, their housing, their social support networks, all of those are areas that I see very important for not only the US, South Korea, and other industrialized nations because as we are rapidly aging and we're starting to see the same thing in Japan. And so that's, for me, that's a policy issue that I believe we really must begin to take a look at to address. I think my thinking has evolved around this issue over the 25 or more years. And the single factor that affects child welfare systems worldwide is poverty. And I think what we have to really educate people about and the core mission of social work is economic justice. We need to make sure that there's food security. We need to make sure that there's clean water. Uh, we need to make sure that a free education is truly free because you, even in countries where there's a free education, there's all these hidden costs. It costs to have clothes to go to school. It costs to put shoes on your feet to go to school. It costs to have a pencil. And you think that that's not a big deal, but if you're living on pennies a day, that is a big deal. And so as I think about the future and the social justice issues, Everybody who is involved globally must believe that everybody has a right to clean water, that everybody has a right to know where their next meal is coming from, that everybody has a right to an education. And I think the, f the more we could start there, that's where we build up. We could solve half of child welfare cases globally if we had anti-poverty activity. So that means microenterprise. That means cash transfers and conditional tra cash transfer programs. You know, it's, it's about social security, but it's also about economic development. And so I think there's always multiple roles that we could train people to be involved in because we have to remember that one of the foundations of social work is to fight against poverty and oppression. And, and I think that is probably globally the biggest social justice issue is the poverty issue. So of course I agree. This is the, the last person's prerogative. It's just, yes. I agree. 
Uh, but I, I want to say a word about social justice because uh, the example of Poland uh, and the Solidarność uh, movements and solidarity is still very fresh. And democracy in Poland is really evolving in kind of alarming ways. A and I think it makes me ask the question, you know, what, what is social work's role in upholding democratic principles and in uh, universal well-being? And what can we do as social workers kind of um, using that old adage from the 60s, you know, think globally, act locally. I mean, what can we do here that will have an impact on clean water, on um, liberty for, for all people, and those big lofty ideas. I mean, what can we do and how can we help our students through our curriculum, through field, um, through the profession of social work to become part of social movements that will move those objectives ahead? I think that's the challenge for, for international social work. Um, okay, those were Good and succinct answers. Does anybody want to comment or raise questions in relationship to any of the comments that were uh, made by uh, our panel in relationship to the future of social work and social justice issues? No other questions at this point of time. David, please. I just want to say one thing about social justice. You may have heard in the last month or so in South Africa, there were riots and some killings in Johannesburg, a little bit in Cape Town, and it was native South African and South Africans against foreign nationals, whether from Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Malawi, even some Americans who were living there. South Africa is trying to understand or, or facing the, how to deal with social justice amongst themselves. And what they're finding now is that many on the continent are saying, wait a minute, we supported you when you were in the throes of apartheid. You now are doing something that is wrong, and we want you to you know, check that and, and, and stop that, because there's a concern that the, the justice for these individuals who are not from South Africa but have moved there because they were chased out or abandoned their native countries to, f to find a better life and now you are doing to them things that you had that you didn't want done to you and your ancestors when you were in South Africa so social justice uh, is it goes both ways it's not by unidirectional it's multi-directional and hopefully as social workers there and and we as social workers who are concerned about the global stage will look at those issues and speak out as well because injustice here is injustice everywhere well put david any other questions or comments in relationship to this particular subject matter well, yes, please. Uh, uh. I guess my question is just, um, uh, my name is Brittany Henry, and I am a MSAS student here working on my master's. And I've studied abroad before, and I guess when it comes to professional work, um, Where's the money? Like, where do I get the money to continue um, wanting to continue to have opportunities to do the research, um, especially because I, at the moment, have no desire to be a professor. And from the research standpoint, I'm more of a grassroots type of, uh, that's my, where my heart's at. And so where can I look for those opportunities to go to international places? Um, one of the things you really that stuck out to me in this paneling is how you guys talked about what we can learn from them versus what we can go over there and fix. And so how can I do that, go over there and learn from them and bring it back here? Uh, Ms. Brittany, I think one of the areas, there are a number of NGOs that work in these organizations. And I think that that's one way to connect in international opportunities for employment to learn what is going on and how they attempt to work with organizations. There's an organization, I cannot remember the name of it, but it works with 
families, many of them with children in Cambodia. And we had a former student who worked in Cambodia for several years. But many of them are camped and work with the river people who have lived on the Mekong River for hundreds of years. There's another, there are several other organizations that are working with infectious disease, uh, particularly with malaria and HIV. Then there's another group of organizations that work with families that are around the, the garbage dumps, which basically talking to individuals who provide services to families that live in and work in landfills is an amazing experience just to, just to hear what they are talking about. So locating NGOs that need your determination, your intelligence, your experience, and your willingness to work there and learn is one way to go. There's also organizations such as WHO, the World Health Organizations, Doctors Without Borders, they use, not use, they have social workers, Engineers Without Borders, all those organizations that we may not think of where social workers could connect really have opportunities for social workers. And then also we, the well-known Peace Corps as well. Yeah. And Fulbright, Fulbright, Fulbright Foundation. Yeah. Fulbright, Fulbright Foundation. Fulbright. Mm -hmm. okay. I can expand on that a little bit because I did a little research about uh, what international organizations MSAS alum are employed by at the present time. And it's quite interesting. If we start with the United Nations, uh, we have uh, them being employed by the United Nations Development Program and the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. And I visited alum who are both with those organizations. But more of them are employed with international non-governmental organizations. We have alums that are uh, with Save the Children, with Help Age International, with the International Non-Governmental Safety Organization, with the International Rescue Committee, and the International Justice Mission. These are all MSAS grads who have gone on to be employed by international organizations. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but the jobs are out there if you really are passionate about being involved with uh, international organizations. And we have examples of our alums from the past who are working for those organizations today. Yes, please. Brady's question reminded me of something um, our alum, Michelle Taylor, said on Thursday at the student panel um, that she often thought of international social work meaning that she had to go away and that her job has allowed her to stay in Cleveland and work with international populations. Can you speak a little to what we can do locally to continue to diversify our perspectives, find employment or volunteer opportunities, and where you find that within your own community. Of, of course, I'll get this name wrong, but in, in Cleveland Heights, where I live, there are several refugee organizations, and there are large groups of people who have come from other countries to live in Cleveland Heights, to go to Cleveland Heights schools. There are efforts in the libraries. There's efforts through, I wish I could remember the name of the organization. Um, and do you remember? Us Together, thank you, yeah. So I think just right there off the top of my head, there would be a, a number of possibilities. And, I, and we have field students in some of these organizations as well. There's International Partners in Mission, right. uh, which right. does things globally. The Cleveland International Programs, or the Council on International Programs, I think it's called now. It used to be called Cleveland International Program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I also think the exchanges help. And the big growth area that I see lots of jobs is if you speak Arabic. Yes. There's so many NGOs looking for professional social workers who speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second language that I see now is French. Uh, but the primary language and where lots of, of jobs are opening is if you speak Arabic. And as I mentioned earlier, the world is rapidly aging in a lot of industrialized countries. So being able, having an interest in working with older adults in some places also. And then on the flip side, in emerging countries such as Cambodia and some of the southern countries in Africa, 
also are very, very young, so child welfare issues are very important, also in Central and South America as well. Other questions or comments from anybody in the audience today? Well, hearing none, I think we'll bring the session to a conclusion. I think uh, we owe a great deal to uh, David, Victor, and Kathy for uh, coming and presenting to us uh, because they're all three internationalists, as you can see, who have been very active internationally. And thank all of you for coming and joining us. I think Herman Stein would be very proud of this uh, session and in his name. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.